come on to the third and final project um, for um, the uh, present summing up for best design work produced in the course of an RIBA part two uh, qualification and um, explaining to the previous. Um, I'll, come, I'll, come back, I'll, put, I'll come back to the floor after this for more questions. Uh, but, uh, Nick, what's yours? Um, From the bar, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said uh, um, in the last presentation that it was, uh, it was a delight to follow uh, such uh, eloquently delivered um, proposal in the way of projects. Um, but having seen both of yours, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, I, do, I do think there is a running theme um, of sort of fiction and landscapes and possibilities potentially. Um, I mean, foremost, it's almost articulating an, um, an inquiry, sort of uh, uh, understanding the site. And that's where I sort of fear in my project that the, 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 the site is there, but it's more the sort of uh, fictional um, site that we each have within us, and it's to try and propose a happier architecture, or use architecture to propose happiness within ourselves, sort of mentally site state. So it's a bit um, wishy-washy in a way, some people might say. But the, the, um, I'm going to use some words from uh, Gaston um, Bachelard's uh, Poetry Space, Poetry Space. Um, and then Fett talks about the purpose of fiction, perhaps. Um, he says, by the swiftness of his actions, the imagination separates us from the past as well as from reality. It faces a future. To the function of reality, wise in experience of the past, as it is defined by traditional psychology, should be added a function of unreality, which is equally positive. Any weakness in the function of unreality will hamper the productive cycle. If we cannot imagine, we cannot foresee. And I think that's quite an important um, phrase to, to start um, a project called Who Town which is about winning the um, So Freetown reflects on the past to look to the future, in a way, as we do every day, um, and as we, we've discussed before, um, and proposes an architectural framework of happiness that may be applied into the cities of today. And so, in a way, I, I've chosen the two, two sort of contexts for it. This is um, Winnie the Pooh, sort of uh, coming alive, in a way, into a, a physical site. The physical side is slab. And um, I, I choose Winnie the Pooh in a way because um, there's a dual reality there. Christopher Robin is portrayed as being wholly happy in the story, and uh, he follows the, 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 the trials of his, um, of his um, toy in a way, but also his best friend, uh, Winnie the Pooh. And all of these adventures are somewhat you know, delightfully camp in a way, but also there's, there's a real serious um, moral guidance that happens within it. Um, and so, when in fact he was actually tormented by the book and lived in the shadow of his father, so that's the sort of reality he steps into this fiction to, to um, experience happiness. Um, and from empirical research that I've done in Slough and with um, um, various kids and um, children from industry towns themselves, it is clear that happiness can be found in fictional versions of our true selves. From buying toys, um, and this may be a doll for a child, or a phone for an adult, or a car, or whatever, um, to putting on makeup, and to proving our organic credentials at the farmer's market. These are all sorts of fictional versions of ourselves that we aspire to be. And we, we place ourselves in a, in, a, in a sort of physical us. You know, I mean, the, the reason I chose to wear a jumper like this instead of a shirt is entirely sort of my, um, my sort of idea of what I want to be. So um, we reflect these into our personas and often aim to be our dreams. Uh, so I went to Slough and wondered if it had ever dreamed before. And so Slough is um, uh, perceived as a concrete wasteland. Uh, this is a quote from um, Peter Sykes and many artists have evangelized against its potential um, because of the hard industry that started in the 1920s is almost still there today and it's erupted a sort of uh, social political disputes and uh, a lot of uh, discrimination and stuff because of working classes um, in different areas. Um, and this, uh, this industry 
I wonder, could this be an industry of happiness? Could you, could you not? It's a very sort of lucrative process to sort of, I think, mean, Disneyland in a way. That's that's the way, a place where you, you get happiness, and you, there's quite a fee for it, and it's a very interesting model. I'm not saying I'm trying to recreate Disneyland, but I'm trying to develop a, a, a sort of more critical um, point on what industry is um, in the 1920s as well. Um, so. I actually talk about the 1920s as um, because this project goes by the assumption that student projects are often immortalized in drawings and suggestive, suggestive prose, and ultimately attempt to express an idea or a political opinion. So whether this is based in the past or the future, the critical eye of the work needs the most appropriate context to ensure that the idea is most carefully heard. And so in the 1920s, um, this industry of happiness is seen as a direct comparison with a hard industry at the time to explore the potential of the known then. Um, and so we live in an age that often only looks to the physical world to solve physical problems. I argue that we need to use architecture to cure our mental state in the physical space. If we are content through experiencing these spaces, then we may ask less from the physical world to satisfy our physical state in a way that um, you know, it's almost a quite sustainable project to think of how to, how to, how to cure happiness, you, know, you may ask a lot less. So the point of uh, this slide now is, is um, I'm going through the book and extracting policies of happiness that I, that I sort of have um, uh, believed to be quite important. Uh, could be elements that could be manifested physically as sort of destinations within the site and smell um, that you have a pilgrimage around. And, um, so in a way, the car retail of anxiety. Um, this is sort of when, when middle middle class people go to um, shops to try and get the hoard items that look a little bit rustic and very individual. So they feel individual, but they're just as individual as everyone else is doing that. And in a way, Grayson Perry um, talks a lot of a lot about these sort of these these, um, these obvious things which we sort of try to forget and, and not promote it. But I think it's quite important to try and design using these tactics. Um, yes, so, um, then I did, a, I did a thesis, and this was an opportunity to explore the sort of uh, technical side of it and um, quantify the, the purpose of it, because it's all quite very, very. You could have an argument that you have to try and base it in reality or how you how can develop this properly. So this book, um, I mean, just here, um, um, this is actually like the first sort of diagram to try and explain what I'm doing. On the left side, you've got one focus group, which is children, and the other, which is people from industry towns. And I use, um, use I just ask some questions, what do you think happiness is, basically? And um, a few other things that seem easy. And I've got quite a bit of information back from them. And um, in effect, you know, things like um, an appetite for adventure overcomes comfort. So I put these things into categories, their answers, and the fact that uh, um, ob activities are more important for happiness than objects, and make believe is more important than a sort of conservative um, understanding about the world. And uh, then I put these into images, and I categorized all of these images to try and translate this data into applied visual uh, data to understand what this stuff could actually look like. Um, and then I did these, these quite crude in my opinion right now, like the, the composed images based on this sort of series here. And I, I stacked it in a way that I had it from both children's responses and um, industrial um, town uh, images. And then I created this, these collages and got feedback from it. And then I, in a way, used these as, as sort of design development response um, policies that I would have that I would relate to those extracted <laughs> elements of happiness from the book. Um, and you know, just to name a few, um, the, you know, you include an abundance of flowers and things like this, um, include soft activities, show friendly families, it's all quite corporate in a way, but um, show areas of fun celebration, explore tranquil landscapes, um, avoid uncomfortable images of children. <laughs> well, um, so, and so I, um, I put all of these sort of elements 
together with the, the hoarding of the bits of prose from the book, um, into each of the characters. And each of, each of the characters are represented in the book as having a sort of certain happy trait or a particular personality. And this is a question to us now, you know, we, we, we all have our individual personalities, so what is your specific happy trait that you, you can allow yourself to, to, to work on any further? But in a way, um, you experience each of these characters around Christopher Robin's head in plan. Um, and each of these, these moments, you, you do experience a specific type of happiness, be it uh, reading fictional books in Owl's, um, Owl's library, which is in a forest, or tasting honey delights at Rabbit's picnic. And I mean, Rabbit's an advocate of, um, of food and water and, and plants and, um, and fields, so this takes place in a bit of a I won't dwell on that too long, but in effect, you, you do this five day pilgrimage. That's the sun taking you through each of these, um, these animals, shapes, and plan. And this happens in Christopher Robin's brain to remind us that this is a fictional event, but it's also quite a sort of a serious, real thing for Christopher Robin. I'm not sure if you can see his head yet. And then you've got the eye, in a way, um, which is a big balloon, which is symbolizing sort of life. And but from his eye, pours out this sort of um, questionable tears, in a way, to remind us that the reality of this was not so unhappy. Um, and then, this is, this is a bit of incorporation of the, the current demographics of Slough. There's a lot of, um, in today's day and age, um, disputes, and it is, it, it is perceived as being not um, a, a beautiful city and romantic place. So there, there are certain social um, things that I put together to try and um, better, better, um, better the social environment. I won't go into that too much, actually, but it's just to say that there was, there was a, a reintroduction of today to try and make it relevant to the um, And in effect, you know, Christopher Robin is, uh, and his whole body, the rest of it is, is um, uh, arable land, which is useful. And these are posters, it's the same as the uh, two beginning ones, that sort of um, ask you to come there. Uh, and it's in the same way that London Underground did a series of posters for Metro Line and stuff. You know, to, it's, you're, you're advertising the destination and then using the transport to get there. So London Underground would potentially um, uh, invest in the projects or you know, things like that. It's this is, it says, um, educating your little darlings for the new Britain, and it's about books and um, the, the bookstores at the end, which I'll show you. A merry place to work, live and play together. It's all slightly corporate, actually. And looking at it, it's, it's almost like two um, sticky Disney rides, but I, I think I'm still trying to get those messages without being too cliche. Um, and then, Come up with pilgrimage of happiness, and and you see the, the bottles there, which are the bottles that you go around in and visit each of these destinations from the tears. So you're, you're dreaming in a way because these are the the beds that you sleep in, and they hook onto these um, sort of kitchenettes that you, uh, that you you drop into after each day, and then you go on a full flight to see the um, to see the. Uh, Characters and plan to realise that it's actually what we visited. So we arrive at, um, at Pooh Station, and we see on the left, the top left, that's that's um, Paddington Bear's his friend who's come from Paddington Station, and uh, you get off and you're greeted by all of these all the characters and and, <coughs> and that's just under the honey pot to the left there on the bottom. <coughs> that's where the station is, and then you come and get your designated bottle after changing into your your outfit or whatever you want, you know, who do you want to be, do you want to be a piglet, do you want to be the eel? Um, and then you, you go off with your captain and he uh, delivers you to your, your kitchenette and you're swimming in, so you're, you're, you're going through the tears of Christopher Robin. And this little technical problem mm -hmm. just shows, shows how you have <coughs> dropped and the extent of the whole pilgrimage full place in a way that, that water. Um, and then we go away um, from Piglet to the left to go to Eeyore's, um, who's a fan of nostalgic landscapes and 
wondering and pottering and not knowing why, but that's fine because that's part of our sort of understanding of happiness. Music. We don't really need uh, an objective to uh, look for. And then we go to Owl's Library, and this is you know, jumping up and down this sort of kind of lean to catch a book from the chandelier and then going to the, the bee reading room, which receives back into the forest. So you have this social play time, and then you have this, this connection with your family members or, or friends or whoever. And this is, it's made, mainly, I guess, made for children, but I, I argue that adults are children so much more than they think. And, and this is, in a way, suggesting that we do play still, and you know, adults are playing still. And these take place, each of these little areas of trampolines take place in five or six, five, or five, six, sorry, um, ministries of happiness, so each is a sort of section of the library. We go away from the topic image, which is a trampoline, into the um, rabbit's picnic, which is where you have all of your list on the right hand side and your treasure map, because I found through the research at so you, you do spend these moments of um, the expectation of something is more valuable than actually finding it and having it. The sort of, you know, the, the, the wondering and hoping to get there, the treasure map is an ideal tool for having. And then the bottom image is a game technical study. But just to show that that balloon there, where the rabbit's tail is, you can see, is the honey factory where all the products are made and it's full of flowers and crops. And then we move away from the, the balloon and the grass picnic behind. I'm not sure if you can see the balloon just in the middle, top right. Um, <coughs> and we go on to each of our, our character balloons and we take flight over Christopher Robin's head to realise that we've experienced all of that, that sort of you know, personal, engaged happiness and then see it from a complete abstract land. And we see it in, in plan form. And that, I think that sort of realisation of abstract to experience is quite important that we need to um, look at. And I hope this works, but if you pay attention, yes. That's the best bit. I love that. <laughs> it's easy. Um, so yeah, so now we see Christopher Robin sort of still outlined, but he's defined by a lot of different features um, that are almost the, the works to deliver this happiness and that all of this back of house, basically, to deliver <coughs> the, um, the pilgrimage is quite important. And there's a lot of um, flowers that are made on the UCS foot. Those are the sort of nurseries to develop all the flowers that are transported in this um, network of, uh, of train lines to bring them each fresh each day. And then we arrive on, um, <coughs> on the Six Trees, which is where effectively the, the Emporium is, or the, the museum at the end of the, so the gift shop at the end of the museum. This is where you buy your products after you've seen and experienced them. So this is where it becomes a sort of reminder of an industry. Um, and you can see the, the six pine trees in plan there, and then we have the cart from sale, which is the, just to the left of it. And this is all the sort of things that you experience as you as you uh, meander through all of these honey pots, which are, some are bookshops, some are toy shops, um, some of play pens, uh, and, and you might remember that you, you've collected your Owl's Bookshop admission um, token and your reading list that you used to buy certain things, so there's like ploys to make you buy certain things, but that's, that's just to sort of remind us of this industry. And then we arrive at the Honey Jar Emporium, which is um, almost cliche, um, tries to be a cliche of this, this idea of um, happiness, playful, and industry all in one. And in effect, you know, this is, uh, this is the jar itself, and you can see on the, on the, on the right, the six pine trees. I think, I think the project tries to do so much, but it's about the, the journey that I've taken to, to develop it has been quite important, and I feel like the, the work that I've, I've um, been myself with is, is a journey to help me understand ideas and what the purpose of architecture in the changing world is. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.
because you want to be quite open. Um, I want to put to the panel, um, rather than directing it, but I think it is what you talk about this project, but, um, but how it also deals with this concept of happiness, um, its representation, and, and um, designing a better built environment, and how the, the relevance of happiness. And it's absolutely it's a it's a remarkable piece of work and then the the um the quality of the images and indeed the number of the images and the different types of images is, is really is an achievement. I find it slightly difficult to talk about it because um I think it sets its own definition so much that, and, it, and maybe because there is so much in it, it had to do that and we were kind of proud of it. We were rattling around and I was kind of running, running along behind you trying to keep up. Um, and that in a way, in that process, you said things and then they became true because you had said them and then you wrote something else on that. But I keep thinking, I don't think that, I think that is true. I mean, I, this is, I'm bogged down by um, probably, you know, an over. Um, Supply of sort of sincerity and seriousness. So I found I think there's a lot of irony in your presentation, which I found a little bit deep. And irony in architecture are quite difficult to match. And I really like when you do, and I would say I think we refer to and rely on as philosophies, so it's not that you know I've got any problem with that degree and feels really important. Um, if we're, I just the definition of happiness coming out of the survey of asking children what they thought, and then you filtering that through your own, obviously, interpreting or defining what it was they had said. Uh, there was another of the points where I just felt, hold on, wait a minute, maybe happiness has got more to it than that. So, so I'm not being very articulate about this. I just found, um, yeah, obviously, it, you, you set out to do something, and you achieved at an amazing level because um, you've done Activity and mind boggling piece of work, I would say. But to, for me, it, it, it remains, I mean, this is absolutely no problem, but it remains very much as a sort of, um, as that, as a tour de force, and it's very, um, you know, very clever, very deep, very uh, detailed in its in its description. Um, so it didn't, it didn't touch. Sorry, it didn't actually achieve reality for me. I didn't go out of being a sort of fictional story. Um, sorry, I that answers your question. Yeah, no, I, I, I will jump the gun and potentially be the nasty Kingston person <laughs> <laughs> and, and pick up Sheila's thing. And first of all, say, of course, it's extraordinary. I mean, you won. This is not correct, really. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's great. It's fantastic and well deserved. No doubt about it in the scheme of things. But I, I think there's such. A tantalizing premise that you start from, you know, questions of happiness and really, you know, going for the jugular about space, build space and environment and its responsibilities is only beyond, you know, just this notion of But I wonder if then the next stage, having done this, would be to take those themes and think of them less literally, less prescriptively. Yes, what what Sheila perhaps was suggesting is a this closed world where you're taken on a specific journey and actually you're kind of simultaneously writing a dissertation and doing a design project because you're setting up a narrative and it's within that narrative that the whole thing makes sense. You know, you can't just go in and do things differently. What then the real challenge to, for, for me to do would be then later on as a as a lifetime is to take those themes and deal with them in a far less pictorial or literal way, I would say in a less instrumental way, if that would make any sense, and in a more architectural way. Yeah. An architectural way which is a bit more common and embraces the everyday, does not necessarily need the extraordinary, but maintains the commendable desire to engage those aspects that you started from. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful. So, I mean, there is a, um, I, I felt like there was a sort of purpose to the literal translation. <coughs> <laughs>
I, I think it's a tough one to see. I, I'm, the sitting on the panel, actually, I, I was uh, I, I was actually highly critical of the scheme on the absolute longest review because I think it, uh, the, it, it's incredibly <coughs> regarding in the sense that it's talking about happiness and actually I think if you look at the Garden City movement, I was also looking at happiness and, and the idea of creating this within, within the new city. So, so there's lots of resonances that the project, I think, develops. Um, if I'm if I'm being frank, I think it's a bit, it's an easy target taking on the slough, you know, the Hay yeah. Mars Bar, um, already uh, denigrated in verse by John Betjeman as well, um, and and you know I'm I'm aware that you're aware of all those things as well. Um, if one's being kind of tough about it, ultimately one's critiquing um, a sophisticating a sophisticated and beguiling theme park, um, and and I I. For some reason, whenever when I, when I was listening, there's a there's a final scene in that movie, um, a, Tom, a Tom Hanks movie called Big, where he visits a deserted fairground at the end and talks to some machine, uh, which he subsequently discovered is is not plugged in. And I couldn't help trying to imagine what this place was like when it, when it was deserted and forgotten, because there's that incredible poignancy about the deserted fairground, mm. and it, it, it kept coming back to me this thing. However, we've got to be fair, millions and millions of people visit um, these kind of environments, they get something out of it, they suspend their disbelief in the basic scenario that um, the organisers have developed, and they clearly have um, purpose and meaning in, in 21st century society. So, taking all that on, uh, at the same time, you know, sitting here with an audience of architects, some of whom are probably thinking, well, there's an element here of kind of overstatement and, and dare I say, vulgarity uh, to some of this, is, is, is quite a tough one. And my final thought is that, of course, the house that A.A. A. Milne lived and died in, Cotchford Farm, was also subsequently occupied by the drowned Rolling Stone Brian James. And there's another army to play with.